And here we are. Uh, welcome to our new folks uh, that are now joining. Again, my name is Xavier Williams. Uh, and I have the privilege of starting our final portion of the night, which is Dr. Dean's last lecture. Uh, today, we acknowledge and recognize the profound impact that Dr. Dean has had on each of us as either professor, mentor, colleague, or friend. Dr. Dean's contributions extend far beyond just the walls of the classroom or an office space, but she is a guiding light, illuminating the path for countless students and colleagues with her wisdom, her passion, her unwavering commitment to excellence in student affairs and higher education. Her dedication to teaching, research, and mentorship has inspired generations of aspiring scholars and practitioners and has instilled in them a sense of purpose and possibility. As we prepare to celebrate the ending of one chapter in Dr. Dean's life and wish her much fun and relaxation in the next, I am confident that her teachings, her insight, and her spirit will continue to be a reminder for all of us to do good work in this profession that we love. At this time, because I have a trick set up to Dr. Dean, I would like to welcome to the podium three individuals who will tag team an introduction and a special reflection for Dr. Dean. This time, I call to the podium Dr. Bo Seagraves, representing the Kassad E program, Taylor Page. Taylor Page, who will represent the Kassad M program, and Dr. Dallin Young, who will represent the Kassad in South Africa. <laughs> Thank you, Xavier. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> I'm honored to have been asked as an alumnus to offer reflections on Dr. Dean and her immeasurable impacts on our lives. In 2011, I was one of Dr. Dean's first doctoral advisees to graduate from the Kasadi program. I had arrived at UGA in 2007 just one year after Dr. Dean joined the faculty. And to say we had similar interests would be an understatement. I quickly realized, based on my personal and professional interests at the time, that I wanted to study assessment practices, check. <laughs> In student affairs divisions, check. At small colleges and universities, check. <laughs> we were a match made in Kassad heaven, I believe. One of the pieces of advice I give to doctoral students going through the dissertation writing process came directly from my experience with Dr. Dean. I often share, you want your chair focused on reviewing and critiquing your content rather than being distracted by grammar mistakes and poor writing. So ensure every draft has been meticulously edited prior to submission. As an undergraduate English major and a former English teacher, Dr. Dean rightly has high expectations for her, for her advisees' writing skills. And the last thing I wanted to see on a return draft from her was more tracked changes than comments. <laughs> but on this occasion of Dr. Dean's last lecture, I want to highlight what is far more important than her keen eye for spotting the passive voice or subject for disagreement. <laughs> Dr. Dean is a genuinely wonderful person. She's thoughtful and insightful and always seems to say exactly what needs to be said at exactly the right time. I've watched her diffuse conflict and navigate challenging political circumstances. And on more than one occasion, she's helped me see a much broader perspective that's led to me being far less worked up over something after we've talked. She has an extraordinary ability to connect with people. I'd say she's continued to put those counseling skills to good use long after she's left the clinical world. On behalf of the alumni who are spread across the world, continuing to make a significant impact on lives of college students, I thank you, Dr. Dean. I thank you for your unwavering commitment to excellence, both inside and outside the classroom. I thank you for helping to develop us as better scholars and practitioners. I thank you for your kindness. And I thank you for always delivering a warm smile and a hug 
when many of us didn't know that's exactly what we needed. As you retire, may you continue to find ways to inspire those around you to achieve their dreams, just as you've inspired us. Hello, everyone. Oh. So <laughs> <laughs> Today we gather to honor and celebrate a remarkable individual who has left lasting marks on our lives in the field of student affairs. Dr. Laura A. Dean, our esteemed professor and program coordinator, is retiring after years of dedicated service and profound contribu contributions to shaping the next generation of student affairs professionals. Dr. Dean's impact extends far beyond the classroom. With unwavering dedication and passion, she has instilled in us the essential interpersonal skills and expertise needed to excel in our field. But her influence goes far beyond instruction. She has taught us how to be compassionate and supportive allies for one another, fostering a sense of community and camaraderie for one another that also defines our cohort. Throughout our time in College Student Affairs Administration Program, Dr. Dean has challenged us to push the boundaries of thinking and professionalism. With her keen insight and gentle guidance, she has encouraged us to strive for excellence and never settle for mediocrity. Yet, she has also been a beacon of humor and warmth, sharing in our joys and laughter, even amidst the rigors of academia. One of Dr. Dean's trademark phrases, okay, let's come back together. <laughs> encapsulates her ability to reign in our scattered thoughts and refocus our discussions. With her profound listening skills and uncanny knack for deciphering our ramblings, she has guided us through complex conversations, ensuring that every voice is heard and every perspective valued. As we bid farewell to Dr. Dean, we are filled with gratitude for the wisdom, guidance, and mentorship that she has bestowed upon us all. We are immensely fortunate to have experienced her teachings, learned from her insights, and yes, even been prodded, or perhaps gently nudged, to reach our fullest potential. Dr. Dean, your legacy will continue to inspire and guide us as we embark on our professional journeys. We thank you for your dedication, your passion, and your unwavering beliefs in our abilities. May your retirement be filled with joy, laughter, and countless new adventures. So as we conclude this tribute, let us all join together one last time to say, okay, let's come back together. <laughs> In honor of Dr. Laura A. Dean, a true champion of student affairs and cherished mentor to us all, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I have been given an assignment by Xavier, but I also got an assignment from Dr. Dodd. We saw two, well, one graduate, one soon to be graduate of the programs to support students like these. <laughs> 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 Please donate to the Cooper Dundee Fund. <laughs> Proceeds of the Cooper Dundee Fund will be used to support students like these <laughs> in their educational endeavors while they are in any of the three programs that we support here. So please come to see me, come see Marilee, Dr. Dunn, for information about how you might donate to the Cooper Dundee Fund. <laughs> I don't know, how do I do that? <laughs> so this introduction is is meant to represent the Dr. Dean perspective as one of her fellow uh, colleagues on the faculty of the program. Many of you know that Laura was my doctoral advisor here when I was in the CASA PhD program. And so while I could recount many stories of what I gained from her as a student, I will limit my very brief remarks. I got the assignment in Kasaga. <laughs> to our time together as colleagues. However, Dr. Dean has always been a colleague. Starting with and stretching back to our time as student major professor, we've published together a few times, we've presented together, yet this isn't something that's particular to just me. It's indicative of Laura's orientation to colleagueship. If you look at her CV, it's full of examples of collaborations and connections with colleagues. And that connection has continued. 
This is the doorway chats where one minor observation or quick or question will quickly blossom to some commentary on teaching, learning, or some professional issue in higher education, and frequently about CAS mm -hmm. and the topic that we're both passionate about. So it should come as no surprise that Dr. Dean consistently brings a voice of considered wisdom into our faculty meetings. When I first took the job and moved back to Athens, Laura and I met up for lunch at Mama's Boy, and it was at that lunch that I learned that Laura's retirement would quickly follow that of Diane and Mary Lee. And it was also at that lunch that I had this, the, the realization that someday soon we would be without that considered wisdom um, in our faculty meetings. And in every meeting since, I've been trying to observe and to learn and to glean what I can. Now that might be an impossible task because so many of those perspectives have come from a full career cultivating those perspectives and having a natural disposition to pause, take it in and see things from multiple points of view and to take a measured approach that incorporates the both and. We will miss her wisdom that has come from hard won experience and I hope that we are prepared for the time that it's no longer here. Now I'm gonna be a little self-indulgent and break the rules and admit that what I said earlier about being brief was a premeditated lie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's in service of acknowledging the human being that Laura Dean is. Uh, in 2019, I was a finalist for a job on the faculty at the Higher Ed and Student Affairs Program at the University of South Carolina, where I had been working. And I was good friends with one of the finalists, and before either of us had an interview for the position, we made the commitment that we would keep each other in the loop if we advanced in the process in any way. And shortly after the interview, I headed west to NASPA in Los Angeles, and I found my way to one of the plenary sessions. The speaker was local higher education celebrity, Dr. Sean Hart. I say it that way because um, there's the Sean Hart show. So I, um, as you can imagine, the room was packed and I found my seat and got ready for the Sean Harper show. And near the end of the session, doc, after Dr. Harper's official presentation, and as the room started to clear out, you know, during the question and answer session, but before the session was officially over, you know, back to this, right? You won't go there. Um, I received a text from my friend letting me know that she had been offered the position and was going to take the offer. While I was thrilled for my friend, I was devastated. So while I collected myself, I looked up and looked around to see if there was any familiar face in the crowd. And as I looked to my left, just across the aisle, I saw Dr. Dean sitting there. And I didn't notice her when I sat down. I, like I said, it was a packed house, but there she was. So after the session ended, I walked over and let her know what I had just learned. With grace and empathy, she listened, she expressed her sympathies, and assured me that while this was a disappointment, something would come along someday. There are few people I would have wanted there in that moment as much as Dr. Laura D. She's a counselor, and in that moment, she counseled. And I'm forever grateful for that moment and for the fortune that she was there. The epilogue to that story is that one morning in March of 2021, I received a phone call, and Laura's name was on the screen. I couldn't have been happier and more honored to be invited to come join the faculty with the program and the history and the personal connection that I had than by, than by Laura. I believe that I expressed my emotion in the moment as flabbergasted. <laughs> and I meant that in the, most in the best possible way that I really couldn't believe it. And I've enjoyed the past three years here having her as a colleague. I think about the concept of legacy a lot, especially with the quote, changing of the guard, as Dr. Brittany Williams put it. And I think about how we might carry forward Dr. Dean's legacy, about what I can do and what we can do to honor her and her contributions to the programs, and to fill the hole that will be left when she empties her office. So while, yes, there will be a hole when the last of the books and files and the phrenology head are gone, I want to focus on the and. The and is that it is time for us, her colleagues, to build our own more stately mansions, to contribute our own new noble temples and vast domes to the pearlescent beauty of the Casal programs. And it is time for Laura to leave her outgrown shell by life's unresting sea to take on new freedom in this next chapter. <laughs> and in <laughs> to contribute to that again, and now let's welcome Dr. Laura Dean for our lesson. 
Yes. Wow. I recommend everybody should do this so that you can hear people say stuff like this about me. I am um, touched and moved and humbled and um, keep seeing more and more of you who have joined to uh, be here tonight. And I am just really grateful for that. I'm grateful also for all of the people who are on Zoom uh, because <laughs> while sometimes I have mixed feelings about technology, usually when I'm in the classroom, <laughs> can't get it to work and Dallin's not anywhere near and I'm so <laughs> Tonight I'm grateful because it's allowing um, other alumni and former colleagues and family and friends to be with us as well. This is very surrealistic. I mean, I I know that this is happening, right? I I have known people say you're retiring. I say yes, I'm retiring. <laughs> so we it, it's a thing. It's happening. I've met with HR. Like things are <laughs> um, and yet it still seems just a little bizarre. Um, so with all of that, um, first I want to thank Kasaga. Um, all of the people that you have seen, recognized, and others who were here helping to set up the space, and my faculty colleagues for their hard work in putting all this together. Um, thank you also to the student speakers who were great, and you were the only student speakers ever to stay to your time requirement. I, I really am impressed with you. And congratulations to this year's award winners. Let's have another. So thanks to all of you. There are a lot of places you can be in April, and there are a lot of places you can be on a Wednesday night, but here you are, and I really appreciate that. When we began talking last fall about doing something to recognize my upcoming retirement, I was kind of stumped at first. My good colleague, Dr. Dunn, had set the bar high, regalia and all, but I couldn't quite get my head around that. Perfect for Marilee, not, not what I could envision. Unlike her, I'm retiring at the end of an academic year. She retired in December. And so I keep calling it my graduation. <laughs> That's what we do in May. Okay? Um, although commencement's probably a better word, I hope, for this next chapter coming. But as all of us in higher ed know, um, April, April is a special kind of busy in our world. I don't think that T.S. Eliot was actually thinking about higher education when he called it the cruelest month, but it is. <laughs> Events and celebrations abound, and even though they're wonderful, squeezing one more additional one in seemed like a lot, even for me. So given that, the idea for this two-part blended, we don't quite know how it's gonna work thing um, emerged, and it felt right. The thing I'm retiring from most immediately is my role as a faculty member. And the good students that we celebrated during the past hour and so many before them have been the focus of my work for the last 18 years and more. So celebrating them first as a lead in to my retirement seemed right. So two part of that, got that part. Then they asked me when I wanted to have it. And I want to offer a special note of gratitude that the students who are planning this indulged in my whim. And all of you made the effort to be here on a Wednesday in the middle of April. Those of you who know me well know that I like symbolism and I like things to come full circle. And so you won't be surprised to know that April 10th is not an arbitrary date. 33 years ago today, I defended my dissertation. <laughs> and I chose that date then because it was my older niece's 10th birthday. So it seemed fitting that this formal recognition of my retirement would serve as the bookend to the day I became Dr. Dean. So figuring out the logistics was the easy part, sort of. After that, I had to think about what I was going to say to you tonight. 
calling it last lecture is really daunting. Yeah, it suggests not only something ringing with finality. Somebody in the crowd suggested maybe I have to cancel class for the rest of the semester. <laughs> but it, it feels like it's supposed to be profound and all encompassing and somehow memorable. But I have April brain. And right now, I could more easily tell you about any of my doc advisees' dissertation topics or about my master's students' assessment plans than I could, channeling the scarecrow, think great thoughts. I also originally intended to pull out all kinds of old pictures and interesting images to show you while I'm talking to kind of entertain you and illustrate my thoughts, but April. So... <laughs> This is where some Albert Ellis comes in handy because I, I've tried to get a bit of a rational grip on myself in the midst of all this. I've been to a lot of talks like this and I have loved most of them. <laughs> I really don't remember any of the specifics. I realized that this is also a time to remember what Dr. Angelo taught us, that people forget what you said and they forget what you did but they'll never forget how you made them feel. So I'm just gonna share some things that seem appropriate and you can sit back and not feel obligated to remember any of it, <laughs> but I hope you feel good when I'm done. <laughs> so, where to start? Well, Maria von Trapp would tell us to start at the very beginning. I'm not gonna say. <laughs> Although I won't spend a lot of time there, I will say that I'm grateful and privileged to have been born into a family that loved reading and valued education. I was surrounded by family who were teachers and by books everywhere in our house. I had big brothers who over my life gave me roots and wings. I grew up in a small town where I was known with a good local library that I could walk to. I had teachers who nurtured my love of learning and taught me where the commas go. <laughs> Florence Gillette is why the track changes happen for any of you who want to know that. I went to a small college where I was immersed in the liberal arts and in student life uh, in equal measure, mostly, and where I had faculty who believed I could do things. As time went on, I learned from the high school students that I taught, the families I helped through the admissions process, my own graduate faculty members, my mentors and friends in CAS, and the students and colleagues I had at three different colleges before I came to UGA. And then from so many students, faculty, friends, and colleagues here. And along the way, I've had dear friends and family, those still here and others who've passed on, supporting me and cheering me on, even when I didn't see them as much as I probably should have. At my undergraduate alma mater, in the old main bell tower, there is a plaque that says, we've all been warmed by fires we did not build and drunk from wells we did not dig. Indeed. We inherit the legacies of those who've gone before us. None of us does this alone. The history of any of us, the accomplishment of any of us is the story of a huge web of others who have, at the risk of a really mangled metaphor, paved the way, laid the foundation, and helped shoulder the load. Every one of you here tonight, in person or virtually, has been part of that web, and I'm grateful. So that's all the foundation and background, but what do I want to leave you with if this is my last lecture? So a few thoughts. We're living in a time that's filled with divisiveness and division, a time where we're pulled to see things as this or that, either or, true or false. And to be sure, there are some clear, bright, distinct lines between ideologies and approaches. But for some things, I think it's important to remember the value in the both and perspective. My own path as I think about it has been an exercise in embracing the possibilities of both and. And I promise you, I had no idea what Dr. Dunn was Young was going to say, and he had no idea what I was going to say. So there are several points that little bells of synchronicity are going to go off. So both and over the course of my path. In college, fuzzy liberal arts English major or practical teacher in training. Both 
somewhat intense honor student or sorority president. <laughs> As a high school teacher, focused on the classroom or on my students outside the classroom, both as a grad student and early professional counseling or administration, both ACPA or NASPA, <laughs> both, and the College Counseling Association, all, many, <laughs> and standards or guidelines, both. Student affairs professional or faculty, both still. As a new faculty member in my late 40s, mid-career professional or brand new professor, both. Educator, teacher, or facilitator of development, both, I hope. Esther Lloyd-Jones would say, deeper teaching. I just don't think we're generally well served by trying to put ourselves or others into boxes that rules some possibilities out in favor of others that are constrained by narrow limits. I'm very sure this isn't true in every situation or for everyone. It's probably some sort of Myers-Briggs strengths, colors, Enneagram, big five personality trait I have. <laughs> you know I love a good typology. But I think a useful question is, why does this have to be here? Is there room here for a bowland perspective? I've long thought that we are all in essence, vessels, like bowls. We're containers for what life pours in. When we're young, we're like saucers. We don't hold much. We're shallow, not because it's a bad thing, but because we haven't grown enough yet to develop more depth. That's why when we're young, things can hurt so much. But when we look back, we tend to think that wasn't so bad. When we were little, it hurt with everything we had. But when we got older, we had more. And so we could feel bigger and deeper. As we learn and we experience things and we succeed and we fail and we love and we grieve and we win and we lose and we get hurt and we disappoint others and we miss the mark and we win the race, all of our experiences, good and bad, help shape us into the vessels that we become. Some of those things leave marks that can't be helped. They've affected us for good or for ill. But history isn't destiny, and we're not passive in the face of it. We have choices. And although some are hard, in the face of difficulty, we can shrink and close ourselves off, become smaller people in a misguided attempt to protect ourselves, or we can expand, we can grow to accommodate or even embrace change and newness. This isn't one of those both end options. It's more of a fork in the road or multiple forks that we encounter again and again along the way. The challenge and where the good stuff lies is to expand, grow, become wider and deeper and able to hold more, the good, the bad, the joy, the sorrow, all of it. The most interesting old bowls are the ones that are deep and wide, maybe with a few chips or little cracks, but still able to hold whatever comes. I love this image of growing and expanding. And I also realized that it has roots in one of my other formative experiences. When I was in college, a really long time ago, y'all, there was a popular poster in a little book called All I Really Needed to Know I Learned by Robert I it's full of really wise advice, like share and play fair and don't hit people and clean up your own mess and warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. All good to remember. But what I'm reminded of now is a takeoff on that that was going around at the time. All I really need to know I learned in my sorority. As I recall, it said things like trust your sisters. Don't underestimate the value of a good song or motto. Remember that you're part of something bigger than yourself and what you do reflects on that group. And something to the effect of take the values in the ritual seriously. Like the kindergarten one, all good to remember, but that last one is the one I wanna talk about. One of my sorority symbols and the one I love the most is the chamber novels. You know, it's one of those seashells with the spiral design of ever enlarging compartments 
spiral, like the golden ratio and the Fibonacci sequence. And we'll talk about that another time, but I'm fascinated by them. <laughs> the chambered Nautilus has those segments because a mollusk lives in it. And as it grows, it creates and moves into larger and larger chambers using the empty ones for buoyancy and propulsion. Oliver Wendell Holmes described it beautifully in a poem that starts with lines I love. There will be more stately mentions, oh my soul, as the swift seasons roll. Grow larger, keep expanding. Build the more stately mansions, oh my soul. Embrace the both and, work to enlarge your vessel, not close yourself off. Keep growing. You may be wondering what this all has to do with anything related to student affairs or being a faculty member or having had a career or anticipating retirement. That's a reasonable question. As I was putting this together, I too at one point wondered whether that where that was going. <laughs> Stay with me. <laughs> First, we are in a field, we meaning student affairs people. We're in a field grounded in an assumption of change, a belief in growth. After all, we call it student development. If we didn't have a fundamental belief in learning and development, why would we bother to try to create environments that facilitate positive things? Why would we identify intended outcomes? Why would we be interested in whether they're met? It's just like class. <laughs> why outcomes? Why measure them? Of course, development isn't the exclusive domain of our field, and lots of people turn out wonderfully well without ever encountering our programs and services or having a higher ed experience at all for that matter. It's not that growth doesn't happen without us. It's that we believe that it can be fostered effectively in the contexts that we help create. I've long thought that student affairs is a bit like science fiction. Hear me out. <laughs> We're in the business of creating worlds. We create spaces and experiences and interactions and opportunities, explicit and implicit, in-person or virtual, all with the intent of creating positive outcomes. Remember, student engagement isn't just about what the students do. It's also about how we employ our resources to create the opportunities for them to take advantage of. As books like The Left Hand of Darkness or The Gripping Hand illustrate, starting with different assumptions and different realities leads to different perspectives and new ways of seeing the world. Isn't that really what we're trying to do? If you've had me for class, you may remember a poem that I often share that for me captures this idea. I heard it at my first ACPA in Washington, D.C., long before most of you were born. <laughs> the speaker was Maya Angelou, and it made an impression on me. She read a poem by Waring Kimi, who was a poet of the Harlem Renaissance, and it's called No Images. She does not know her beauty. She thinks her brown body has no glory. If she could dance naked under palm trees and see her image in the river, she would know but there are no palm trees on the street and dishwater gives back no images. What Dr. Angelou talked about then was that as student affairs professionals, we are called to be the palm trees and the river. We are called to be the place where students can see themselves reflected back as they can be, as they might be, as they can hope to be. And it's in our relationships with them in the way that we relate to them that they can see themselves through our eyes and see the possibilities in themselves. That's why it's so important to learn about working with students and to do our work intentionally. Because if their own experiences haven't shown them the possibilities in themselves, then it's up to us to do that. You've probably heard me say that the world would be a better place if there were more student affairs people spread across it in lots of different places. And I believe that deeply. Student affairs professionals are wonderfully competent, skilled, flexible, interesting, committed people who know how to triage a crisis and reset a room, sometimes simultaneously. <laughs> In my experience, student affairs at its best is a both-and perspective, 
and one that strives to create environments and facilitate interactions that are challenge characterized by challenge and support, deeper teaching, learning and development, theory and practice, planting seeds, and rejoicing when they blossom. It's important work they do. It's important work we do. And whether it happens on a campus or in an organization or a company or a setting that bears little resemblance to higher ed, it still makes a difference wherever student affairs people go. When I was at ACP recently at our program gathering and people were saying very kind things in honor of my retirement, I was moved and humbled and a little amused to hear what of all the things I've said over the past 18 years stuck for people. <laughs> so in closing, by way of offering some thoughts for you to take away, I do want to reshare some things that you may have heard me say before, but I hope some of it's useful in your work with students or otherwise. Different things are called for in different situations. Sometimes you need a formal portrait. Sometimes a phone snapshot will do. Sometimes you want to mark the occasion with a really expensive wine. Sometimes two buck chuck or boxo wine makes sense and means that there ain't need. Figure out what the situation comes for. Some things are sprints. <clears throat> Many are marathons. And even more are or might be or should be lovely relaxing saunters through the woods. Not everything has to be done at full speed all the time. When others don't meet your expectations and you're frustrated and annoyed with them, ask yourself, how would they have known? Holding others accountable is good, but only if you can answer that question first. When faced with a problem, see if you can figure out the current picture, the preferred picture, and the way forward. <laughs> and don't rush stage one. <laughs> Those of you who don't know what that means, others will tell you. Look up who did it. <laughs> Listen to understand the whole story before you try to rush in to fix it. Also, your experience is not their experience, and your advice may backfire. It's not just a problem to be solved, an issue to be fixed. It's an opportunity to help others learn. When things are hard, and you feel lost and overwhelmed, as my friend Gary Green once wisely told me, you just do the next thing. That's all you can do, literally, and all you need to concentrate on. Just figure out the next thing and do that. And finally, when something big is coming, and you're nervous about it, remember, if you've prepared, you don't need luck. You've already made your own because oh, luck favors the prepared. I don't know if I was fully prepared when I became a faculty member. I think it did include a bit of luck along the way. But it's been my honor and my privilege to work as an educator for the past 40 odd years and in CASA and SAL at UGA for the past 18. I never forget that this is the program that Ted and Roger built. And I'm grateful to have been one of the people entrusted with the stewardship of it. I'm grateful to Diane and Mary Lee for sharing it with me for so many years. And to Georgiana, Ginny, Katie, Dallin, and Lindy for deciding to join us and being such great colleagues. I know that the program will thrive under your leadership and care, whether or not this is the moment you wanted me to pass the torch. I'm grateful for my good colleagues across the university who do this important work and support our students every day. And most importantly today, I'm grateful to all of my students, past and present. I have learned from you. I've enjoyed you. I've laughed with you. I've cried with you. I've been challenged by you. I've been made better by you. And I am so very proud of all that you've done, wherever you are and all that you will still do. You are indeed my legacy. Thank you for taking the time to be here, to share this with me, and go dogs. <laughs>